Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you to today's Medical Center Hour, a program titled Unaccompanied, Central American Migrations and the Refuge of Poetry. I'm Marcia Day Childress from the Center for Health, Humanities, and Ethics here in the UVA School of Medicine. We're delighted to see all of you here today for this program. Our Medical Center Hour today features Salvadoran poet Javier Zamora, who entered the U.S. from Central America via the southern border as an unaccompanied minor, age nine. In reading selections from his remarkable book, Unaccompanied, and in conversation this hour with UVA pedi pediatrician and poet Irene Matthew, Mr. Zamora will reflect on the experience of migrating to this country as a child to join his parents. He will also address how writing poetry has helped him to come to terms with that difficult journey, the ideas of home and his sense of self. Certainly when it came time to remember his childhood experiences in El Salvador, in transit and in the United States, one challenge was finding words in Spanish and in English, his languages old and new, for what had happened, for what registered with him, body and soul and what mattered. Poetry seems very much to have held a key to this puzzle. At a time when the perils of migration and border crossing, especially for children, are in our headlines, we hope that this presentation can help us, particularly health professionals and healthcare organizations, to care better for newcomers in our midst. It's my pleasure to welcome both Javier Zamora and Irene Matthew to this program. You'll find short biographies of both in your handout. At the close of their conversation, there will be time for your questions and comments. As you may have noticed, if you entered at the upstairs door, UVA Bookstore is here with books by both Mr. Zamora and Dr. Matthew. Uh, they're available for sale and for signing at the uh, upstairs entrance again after the program. I'd like to say a big thank you to the Department of Pediatrics for being our generous partner on this program, making Javier Zamora's visit to UVA possible. In addition to this Medical Center Hour, Javier and Irene will also present tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. at Pediatric Grand Rounds, uh, just down the hall in room 1014, Pin Hall. Also, just to let you know, on Thursday evening tomorrow night, starting at 6, Irene Matthew will be one of three poets reading in a special program at UVA's Fralin Museum of Art on Rugby Road. The other poets are Lauren Elaine and Valencia Robin. So to begin, we'll hear from Irene Matthew and then turn things over to Javier Zamora, and then finally to you. So welcome. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you to Marcia Childress and the Center for Biomedical Ethics and Humanities, as well as the Department of Pediatrics for helping us bring Javier to Charlottesville. Because of your presence here today, I don't think that I have to convince you of the importance of the humanities and literature in medicine. But I would like to say just a few words about why I think poetry specifically is important to what we do here in the Medical Center. Research has shown that literature helps to make us more empathic and compassionate providers. It expands our understanding of the world and our patients' lives, strengthens our imaginations, which I would argue is critical to the practice of medicine, and it staves off burnout. If we try our hand at reflective writing, we gain benefits in the form of stress reduction and finding increased meaning in our work. Because poetry specifically experiments with language, I believe it's a particularly potent way for healthcare providers to learn how to listen better to our patients, who often use metaphors, similes, imagery, and other poetic devices in their everyday speech. And poems are short, so they're easy for a busy nurse or doctor to read in a few quiet moments. Today, we are pleased to welcome a particularly extraordinary poet to UVA. Javier Zamora was born in El Salvador and immigrated to the United States in 1999 when he was just nine years old, traveling unaccompanied 4,000 miles across multiple borders from El Salvador to the US to be reunited with his parents. Unaccompanied, his first poetry collection explores how immigration and civil war have impacted his life and his family. This collection won the 2018 North California Book Award, the 2018 Firecracker Award, 
and was a finalist for the 2019 Kate Tufts Discovery Award. He is also author of the chapbook Nueve Años Inmigrantes, Nine Immigrant Years, which won the 2011 Organic Weapon Arts Contest. Zamora holds a BA from the University of California, Berkeley, where he studied and taught in June Jordan's Poetry for the People program and earned a Master of Fine Arts from New York University. His poems have been featured in publications such as Granta, The Kenyan Review, Poetry, The New York Times, and many others. Zamora has received many honors, including a 2015 NEA Fellowship, the 2016 Ruth Lilly Fellowship, a 2016 to 2018 Wallace Stegner Fellowship, the 2017 Lannan Literary Fellowship, and the 2017 Narrative Prize. For those of you who aren't familiar with the literary world, trust me, that's an impressive list of accolades. In 2016, Barnes & Noble granted the Undocu Poets, of which he's a founding member, the Writer for Writers Award for working to promote undocumented or previously undocumented writers. Most recently, he was a 2018 to 2019 Radcliffe Fellow at Harvard University, where he was working on a memoir and a second collection of poems. He lives in Harlem, New York. Javier is truly a force in contemporary poetry, and his work has made me, for one, a better physician. We're honored and delighted to welcome him to UVA. Javier will give a presentation of his poems, after which he and I will have a conversation, and then we'll open it up for audience Q&A at the end. And as you heard, we'll have a book signing following that. Thank you. How's everybody doing? Are we good? All right. Um, I wasn't expecting the cold, so I think I'm catching a cold. So I'm sorry. Um, thank you all for bringing me here. It's a huge honor, and I guess to talk about the poems that I'm going to read to you, I try to select the ones that show, one, my mindset before immigrating, and two, what the trauma and all of that did to a little kid. So they're all pretty much based of a nine-year-old. And I'll read a short excerpt of uh, prose as well. And I'll start um, with the poem that I start every reading with, and it's a poem to my grandma. And the backstory is that for, I came here when I was nine, and for most of that time until last year, I was undocumented, so I couldn't go back to El Salvador. And my mom left when I was four, and my dad left when I was one years old, so who I consider my mom is my grandma. And just as physicians, there's also that once a kid comes here, there's also the longing for what's left behind that also takes place. And that, that I think that that more so than the trauma of immigrating here really defined me my refined me in this country. And so um, this is a letter to my grandma, who I hadn't seen for 19 years. To Abuelita Nelly. This is my 14th time pressing roses in fake passports. For each year, I have climbed Marañón trees. I'm sorry I've lied about where I was born. Today, this country chose its first black president. Maybe he changes things. I've told mom I don't want to have to choose to get married. You understand. Abuelita, I can't go back and return. There's no path to papers. I've got nothing left but dreams where I am, the parakeet nest on the Flor de Fuego, the paper boats we made when streets flooded, or toys I buried by the foxtail ferns. Do you know the ferns I mean? The ones we planted the first birthday without my parents. I will never be a citizen. I will never scrub clothes with pumice stones over the big cement tub under the almond trees. Last time you called, you said, my old friends think that now I'm from some town between this bay and our estero, and that I'm a coconut brown on the outside, white inside. Abuelita, please forgive me, but tell them they don't know shit. Thank you. <clears throat> you can clap, you can laugh, it's okay. 
Um, and I, I don't know who one of you mentioned why poetry. And it, it literally, I started writing poetry because it's short. And I started writing poetry pretty late, um, when I was 18, 19. And it was around the time when, bless you, when I was, uh, when I was applying to college and I, it really sunk in that I was not like other students. Like I got into UC Berkeley, I got into like top schools, but I chose UC Berkeley because at the time it was the cheapest because I didn't and couldn't qualify for FAFSA or any federal grant. I didn't have a credit card, I couldn't take out loans. So I had to work and go to school. And then that's how poetry came into my life. And I would write it and feel better about myself because you can really write like 10 lines and feel good. But now um, I have a green card, I uh, have a job, etc. So now I think I have the privilege to write my story in prose. So that's what I'm doing now. And I'll read you the end of the first chapter. It's short. And this is what I remember the leaving was. Because I was nine years old and my grandpa was with me up until Guatemala. And this is me saying goodbye. And before this, I, they, nobody told me I was going to leave until two weeks before it was going to happen. And nobody told me when that day was going to be. So this is me waking up to having to come to the United States. <laughs> it's dawn, an indigo like when mom left. Molly, who's my aunt, kisses me awake and I have to get ready. The roosters crow. The dogs bark, the birds sing, the world is waking up. To shower, I pull water from a well with a bucket. The stars turn off one by one. Grandpa already showered. Abuela dries me off. Molly irons my clothes. The outfit has been picked out. A nice dress shirt, dark blue, dark blue jeans, a black belt, black dress shoes. Next to the hard-boiled eggs, avocado, queso duro, and tortillas, a black backpack. It's not my TMNT backpack I take to school. This one is black. Even the brand name has been crossed out. Inside it, a dark t-shirt, black pants, two pairs of underwear, toothbrush, comb, toothpaste, soap, shampoo, and another dark blue short-sleeved dress shirt. There's a notebook, pencils, and the assignments some of my teachers gave me. Everything has to be dark colors, Mali says. The coyotes orders. I eat. Grandpa already ate and waits by the door holding my black backpack and his own regular backpack. He looks at his watch. Abuela combs my hair. Mali kneels in front of me to button my shirt. She tucks it in, kisses my forehead. Abuela kisses me, kneels to hug me. Then Mali and Abuela hug me at the same time. Only now I cry. Te queremos mucho, Chepito. Te cuidas. Que Dios te bendiga aquí y siempre. Aquí siempre vamos a estar rezando por vos. Que llegues con bien, Javiercito. Then they make the cross over my forehead, over my head, over my entire body. Grandpa grabs my hand, walks me past the door. Don't look back, he says. But I do. I see Abuela and Mali in the middle of the door, holding each other. Come on, Grandpa says. And we walk. It's only the second time I read that out loud. It's weird. Um, um, it's interesting because I think I've, I wrote the poetry in a very desperate time in my life and now writing the prose. I'm reliving those memories, but at first I try to write it like a regular memoir 
saying, like from now looking back, and I wrote it in, and then I tried writing it in third person, and I think those two attempts failed because I was too distant from it, and until now, I'm like trying to put myself in a night in the body of a nine-year-old, which is what my therapist always said. You know, it's like your shadow. You always have this little nine-year-old that's always going to follow you for the rest of your life. And that was the, that's the hardest part in therapy and, I guess, in the writing of it that has been the hardest part of it as well. So we'll see where it goes. Um, and... And this one, it's about, from my grandma's perspective, it's a poem, it's short, and it's um, her saying goodbye. And culturally, this is also very hard for an entire generation of Salvadorans who have fled. Um, in the 80s, one-fifth of our population either died or left to the United States primarily. And now the same thing is happening. We had a huge spike in immigration and from 1999 to 2002, which I was a part of, uh, which numerically and statistically it's higher than the spike of the recent years, So, which is my problem with the immigrant crisis because we've always had an influx of people. It's just that now the cameras are on us. Um, anyways, culturally, my, my grandma had three daughters and at least one of them had to stay and like look out after her. And that has not occurred. So then there's like also what immigration does to the people that get left behind. And this is me trying to speak from my grandma's, in my grandma's voice. And in El Salvador, we don't have seasons. It's just dry and wet, that's it. Abuela says goodbye. Javiercito. You're leaving me tomorrow when our tortilla and milk breasts will whisper, te amo. When I'll pray the sun won't devour your northbound steps. I'm giving you this conch swallowed with its deltas, waves, and the sound of absorbing sand. Hold it to your ear. I'm tired of my children leaving. My love for you shatters windows with birds. Javiercito, let your shadow return alone or with sons, but soon. Call me mamá, not abuelita. All my children learn the names of seasons from songs. Tonight, leaves fall. There's no autumn here. When you mist into tomorrow's dawns at the shore of somewhere, listen to this conch. Don't lose me. Mm. I think that that's enough of having of leaving. And then the other tough part of being a kid here, and it's also weird having gone through something similar and reading stuff in the newspapers, because rarely do they ask the kids or even the teenagers or the adults what it's like. Rarely do they, do they have an eye or a say in all the articles being written about us. And still, like, there's still, even in prose, uh, I think which is why, like, yeah, I was angered into trying to write a memoir because there's yet to be a Central American memoir from, like, everybody writes about it. There have been journalists who have write, written about us, but never us doing the writing ourselves. And there are writers out there. Something to think about. And, okay, this is, I'll read two poems of Crossing. And... To add on to that as well is this next poem, I wouldn't be here if it weren't for a teenager who was running from the gangs in El Salvador, and he was an MS-13 member. And so another thing to complicate, and here in Virginia, you have a huge MS-13 problem, but or closer to DC, but it, I was, it's, they're still human beings, and they're they have emotions, and it's, it's hard to be empathetic 
for some of them, but I, I literally, I, I, I read this one to show another side of what somebody who has chosen to be or not chosen to be a gangster is capable of. And this is second attempt crossing. And I don't know his name, his nickname was Chino because he looked Asian and Latinos were racist as fuck. So <laughs> this is about him. And we crossed through the Sonoran Desert in Arizona. Second attempt crossing for Chino. In the middle of that desert that didn't look like sand and sand only, in the middle of those acacias, whiptails, and coyotes, someone yelled, La Migra, and everyone ran. In that dried creek where 40 of us slept, we turned to each other, and you flew from my side in the dirt. Black-throated sparrows and dawn hitting the tops of mesquites. Against the herd of legs, you sprinted back toward me. I jumped on your shoulders, and we ran from the white trucks, then their guns. I said, freeze, Chino, para, por favor. So I wouldn't touch their legs that kicked you. You pushed me under your chest, and I've never thanked you. Beautiful Chino, the only name I know to call you by. Farewell, your tattooed chest, the M, the S, the 13. Farewell, the phone number you gave me when you went east to Virginia and I went west to San Francisco. You called twice a month, then your cousin said the gang you ran from in San Salvador found you in Alexandria. Farewell, your brown arms that shielded me then, that shield me now from La Migra. I know it's weird, it's like sad shit. And you're like, do you clap, do you not? It's okay, I get it. Um, okay, so then this one is the beginning. Then you go through this hard shit as a little kid and then you come here, and the first thing you do is go to the doctors to get all your immunizations, because you can't go to school unless you have your immunizations. And then at school, luckily, in 1999, um, California had just, uh, had just abolished a very racist law that they passed in 1994. So there was a lot of funding for ELL, which was called ESL at the time. And I actually had a therapist that, that I had to meet with once or twice a week for the first like three months. And this therapist um, made me, um, think, thankfully, she made me write a book. Um, I would color, like she was like, oh, can you just like tell me what you just lived through, what happened? And I would tell her in Spanish because I was learning English and she would write stuff in English, and I would draw what I would see. And so I still carry, that's like my most prized possession, and I still carry this book. And this is a short poem taken kind of from that book, and there was also misunderstandings between me and her that she couldn't catch, or that I withheld from her. From the book I made with a counselor my first week of school, and this is her, her handwriting. His grandma made the best pupusas, the counselor wrote next to stick figure abuelita. I had colored her puffy hair black with a pen. Earlier, dad in his truck always looked gringos in the eyes. And mom, never tell them everything, but smile, always smile. A handful of times I've opened the book to see running past cacti from helicopters running inside detention cells. Next to what might be yucca plants or a dried creek, Javier saw a dead coyote animal which stank and had flies over it. I keep this book in an old shoebox underneath the bed. She asked in Spanish, I just smiled, didn't tell her 
not an animal. I knew that man. And I read two more. And then we'll open it up. And to complicate things even more, um, I now have problems with liberals and I have problems with conservatives. And the problem with liberals is that it's hard for us to understand why, well, many things, but why the Border Patrol is 60% made up of La Latinos or Hispanic Americans. And I think it's hard for us to understand that 33% of us vote voter Republican because the Border Patrol is still one of the best jobs that you can get in one of the poorest areas of the United States, which is along the border. And that not all of them are bad. Most of them are. Probably, probably like 98% of them are. So I agree with that. But there is a few of them that are good. And this is a poem about one of them. Because this actually happened. And we tried to cross. One time when we tried to cross, this man did what I'm about to read about. And also the context of that is so there's a, po uh, a memoirist, Francisco Cantu, who wrote, he served in the Border Patrol, and then he wrote a memoir about it, and then there were protests. He expected protests from like conservatives of old Border Patrol agents, and that's not who protest protested his book. It was liberals from like the Bay Area in Berkeley, primarily. Um, and now me and him are friends, because we were supposed to read at a Berkeley reading, and then instead we went to a, to a bar and just talked, and uh, like somebody who has crossed the border, somebody who managed the border. And now we just went back to the border. We went inside of the detention cell. And then we went to, he is the person who actually like showed me, because I'm writing this memoir now, who showed me. He's like, you probably crossed through here because this, this, and that. So now we're friends, so that, that can happen. It's kind of like the Ellen DeGeneres and George Bush thing, <laughs> you know? We should be friends, because that's how you make a fucking change. So this is a poem about a good Border Patrol agent. Remember, only 2% of them are good. <laughs> Let me try again. I could bore you with the sunset, the way water tasted after so many days without it, the trees, the breed of dogs, but I can't say there were 40 people when we found the ranch with the thin white men, his dogs, and his shotgun. Until this 5 a.m., I couldn't remember there were only five or seven people. We had separated by the Palo Verdes. We meaning four people, not 40. The rest, I don't know. They weren't there when the thin white man let us drink from a hose while pointing his shotgun. In Pocho Spanish, he told us, si correr perros at a car, if run, dogs trained, attack. When La Migra arrived, an officer who probably called himself Hispanic at best, not Mexicano like we called him, said, buenas noches and gave us pan dulce y chocolate. Procedure says he should have taken us back to the station, checked our fingerprints, etc. He must have remembered his family over the border or the border coming over them because he drove us to the border and told us, next time, rest at least five days. Don't trust anyone calling themselves coyotes bring more tortillas, sardines, and water. He knew we would try again and again, like everyone does. And finally, a last one. And there's a weird part in it. You can laugh. It's OK. Um, and. So I, get, I came here after experiencing all of that. And then I go to the doctor's office, which some of you in here are. And 
it was really it was really important and i think it made me feel more comfortable that 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 doctor spoke spanish and i think it's a very simple thing and because now i've been in hospitals with my aunt who has cervical cancer and nobody none of the people that treated her knew spanish and she felt as her because she was undocumented at the time she still is undocumented so she one felt weird going to get service at a hospital and two nobody spoke her language and three even the in 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 San Francisco there are people who uh translate or whatever interpreters but even that in that interpreter was spoke a completely different spanish than salvadoran spanish so also thinking and being mindful of the different the spanishes and if you hear double sale which is what we speak it completely makes us comfortable and so legally i couldn't translate without that person because legally they had to be present in the room so i would like correct that person and like be there with with my aunt and a similar thing happened to me when i was 9 and this is a poem about that so again i just crossed the border and this is the first week cuz i have to get immunizations etc thank you all for listening this is the last poem and then we'll talk doctor's office first week in this country it's procedure to inspect the ass of an immigrant kid undress put this gown on the doctor will be here soon that first day after sonoran desert i showered for hours when we got to parents apartment father showed me the way to turn the knob that first day how things worked i hadn't seen him since i was one i didn't know him know him this is how you make your peepee grow he said so it's bigger so it's the biggest he said sometime that first month or that first year pull pull i did pull do it now you're young it will work he said did anything happen the doctor asked in front of my parents then alone did anything happen along the way in spanish all of this in spanish starting with es procedimiento this is how you get hot water twist then pull no i had never used the sponge soap bar and hand was enough back there next to a well I'd never seen a shower. Parents said it that way in English, shower. That first shower, my dirt drew a dark rim around the linoleum. You will hear from us next week. I came back for all the necessary shots. I grew up across the street from a clinic. Every kid cried. I came back. I got shot. I didn't cry. I kept turning the wrong knob even after dad showed me then mom showed me then we showered together to make me comfortable with my own body again with theirs with anyone's it burned that first time my skin hot water nothing happened it burned i'm sure seguro que nada pasó thank you Okay. There, There you go. Yeah. Thank you Javier. That yeah. was amazing. Um and so I just wanted to ask a few questions to start a conversation and then open it up to the audience. But one thing I really love about your poems is that they tell stories. They're not um they they each have a narrative as you were kind of explaining before each one. And as healthcare providers, we're trained to listen to people's stories. and to understand what they're going through and you alluded to this a little bit at the beginning but I'm curious about the difference in um sort of your approach to storytelling in poetry and and prose now that you're writing a memoir how does that change the way that you tell a story or think about telling a story um the weird thing with prose I feel like 
in poetry, it's always like show, don't tell. And it's the same thing with prose as well, like show, don't tell, but you actually have to tell a lot more. It's like, I was walking to get this cup of water, like blah, blah, blah. When in poetry, you would just say the cup of water and that's it. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and, um, so that's, it's different. And I guess for my own process, I guess I'm a writer because of the trauma that I experienced. And it's very cliche to say, but it actually has helped me a lot. And I think as a byproduct, it has helped my family. So all this stuff that I just told you, like through poetry and prose, my family did not talk about. It was even with my parents, I've only talked to them about the, so it took me eight weeks to get here. It only, I've only talked to, had that conversation with my dad twice and with my mom once because it's very hard for them to talk about it, to like have their, I'm an only child, for their only child to, for them not to know where he was for eight weeks. You can imagine the horrors and the trauma that that has. And poetry slowly, again, is very fast and very quick to write. And that made me begin to ask questions and when I first started to read poems out loud, um, I invited my parents, and my first poems were even more anti-parental. I was a teenager, so I was like, why did you ever do this to me? And I was lucky that my parents are masochists or something, because they would show up to my readings, and they would cry, and then that would start a conversation. So I, I, I think I deviated from your question. But That's okay. That's, right, yeah. That's okay. Um, I'm also curious, you talked about when you were in El Salvador, you talked about the journey and you talked about the first few months of arrival. And one of, I believe one of the resources on your handouts is a podcast that you did with Latino USA about your first trip back to El Salvador. So for the people who haven't heard it yet, could you kind of briefly tell us what that was like in the context of, of the work that you already read? Um, it, writing the book I never imagined going back. Like the first poem that I read, like um, I sincerely thought that I could never be a citizen in this country because like there was this huge hope with Obama and Obama didn't do shit. So I was like, fuck, um, I'm never gonna go back. Um, and that was the sentiment. So in a way, when I first started to write the poems, I idolized my childhood and what the time that I spent, which historically too was mm -hmm. the safest times El Salvador has witnessed from like 1993 mm -hmm. till 1999. Mm -hmm. And so that was, I held that so close and like also very cliche, I went back and everything seemed bigger or smaller than it was. My town is very small. There's only one asphalted road um, it still floods. And so all these things that I don't, I'm too, in a way, Americanized now. But what is added to that is the danger and the violence. And I have, I went back to El Salvador because I crossed here illegally and I was in the process of obtaining my green card, which is an EB-1, also known as a Einstein visa. I like to throw that in there. Cause, um, an Einstein visa, which is super hard to get. And, but I had to go back because of my illegal entry and interview and do my medical exams in El Salvador as if I hadn't been here for 19 years. Mm -hmm. And so I was very scared to go back and because I was exposed to um, that lung thing. Tuberculosis. Tuberculosis, TB. And, and so I had, then I, I also had to take some medicine to like completely eradicate it. Mm -hmm. I don't know, you, guys, you guys understand more than I do. Mm -hmm. And so that, was, that could have been a problem. This is done. I had to show that I, was, that I had completed this, this um, pill system for like two months, et cetera. So that was one aspect. I also stopped. I had some like um, gray areas in my driving record that I was also very scared for, mm -hmm. which I don't really talk about because my lawyers told me not to talk about it if you listen to the podcast. So the fear was that, that if this person denied me the green card, I would have to stay in El Salvador for 10 years, wow. which I was not ready to do. I probably would have like risked again and like probably come here or something. Mm -hmm. And so that, that was the fear. And at the same time, when I was in El Salvador, I stayed there four weeks, five people were killed in my hometown. 
So there's that. I don't remember pe people getting shot in my hometown. So there's mm -hmm. all of that, and that's why people aren't leaving. Yeah. yeah. Um, so this is a really difficult moment, obviously, as you alluded to, for our country around the immigration conversation. And I'm curious what specifically you think poetry might add to that conversation, and also to our conversation as healthcare providers as we take care of patients who may have just crossed a border. Um, how do you think poetry can help us be better at these conversations and better healthcare providers? I think uh, reading, for better or for worse, poetry has a gets a cliche of like these are people's like hardest, darkest feelings, and it is they are for the most part. And I think for reading poetry by immigrants or people who are previously undocumented, if that's who you're going to be attending, I think you really get into the psyche mm -hmm. of what these people have gone through. And it's hard. Like, I also visit ELL classrooms, and I visit, like, um, high schools. And your personality changes once you immigrate. I was this loud um, kid who I would perform, like, at every talent show, and then I came here super quiet, and I still see it when I go to ELL classrooms. And if you read something, it gives you almost an entryway into a conversation with your patient or potential patient. And that it's all about rattling the cage that we put on ourselves. Mm -hmm. I think once you, you need to find like some keys, maybe poetry might not give you the key, but find something else. If you're partic if you're like attending a lot of Central Americans, like talk about food, you know, very basic shit, like the food, I love pupusas, I love baleadas, et cetera, I love tamales, that like something, have a joke that unnerves the patient because that has always been very helpful for me with like the therapists, with doctors, with even teachers, poetry teachers. Mm -hmm. You know, even in the empathetic world, some teachers don't know, didn't know how to talk to me about what I was writing. And the ones that could also told me, I don't understand what you have gone through. And that's very important, but I'm here to listen. And like, please like share as much as you want or feel comfortable with. Like something like that. Mm -hmm. I think it goes a long fucking way. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And I think that your both your poetry and prose, the way that you describe what's happening, th there's something about it that adds an emotional quality um, to me as a listener and as a reader of your work that feels like you're in that room, you're like standing next to that kid, seeing what's happening. And it's, it's, it's very emotional as a reader too and as a listener, I think. And I'm wondering if that's something that you deliberately set out to do. Do you think it's just a byproduct of being in that emotional space when you were writing? Or if, there, if it was um, intentional, kind of what are the things that you think about to create that kind of emotionality? I think with the poetry, it wasn't intentional uh, at the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't intentional because I just needed to write and put stuff on paper for my own psyche. Like I, I, was, I went through a very dark time in, in college, because I was at this very fancy university. I had, I graduated with like a 3.9. And I was like, why does this matter? Why, you know, that, that mm -hmm. feeling. And so I just needed to write and to put stuff on paper. Now, um, I think it is more intentional. I think that shift of writing from the nine-year-old's perspective, I hope that that, it creates an emotional space because usually there, there has, like, the memoirs that I've read about immigrants or about immigration are always talk from, like, now looking back at that. And I don't really like what the older person is, like, this is what I found out about, and this is what, you know? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And so I, I, want, I just want to, my memoir is only going to take place over seven weeks. Mm -hmm. And I want to situate the reader in the psyche that I experience. Because maybe that way you feel an emotion that will change things. Because now we read and read and read. We see images of immigrants. We read about what they go through, but nothing gets done. Mm -hmm. So it has to be something else. Yeah. So I think that's why like situating the reader in the emotional space, hopefully that has a, a bigger impact.
Because uh, like you said, I mean, there are not that many, if any, Central American voices that are in the spotlight of the mainstream literature that are writing about these experiences. And, and I think it's so important to situate it, like you said, in that nine-year-old's perspective, because that's perspective we don't hear. Like, even if you have a writer who's made it, they're an adult, they're, re they're looking back. And especially for me as a pediatrician, you know, my patients are much closer to that nine-year-old experience and headspace. And so for me, I'm more curious, like, what are those kids going through that I'm not ever going to hear in the news or read about in a book? So I'm really excited about your memoir. Do you have a timeline for when you might finish that or when it would be published? I'm supposed to finish it by January. Okay. But we'll see. <laughs> Probably won't happen. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to open up to questions from the audience. And we have a couple of mics um, that we can bring you, so uh, you can be heard on the recording asking your question. Um, I'll also ask that you identify yourself before you ask your question or make your comment. You're welcome to direct your question or comment to either of our speakers or to both. Um, I'll just open it up once, uh, just to start. You read us, Javier, you read us one poem in the voice of your grandmother. Um, but what I found remarkable in the book were the, um, the poems in which you also voiced um, your father and your mother. And I wondered if you would read one of those to us. Because again, to enter into, I think your father was 19 mm -hmm. and your mother 18. 18. Um, that kind of fluidity of your imagination to enter that space and to know or to try to know who they were mm -hmm. at the time, at a time difficult for them, was really quite amazing. Right. Well, the backstory to that is that my, once I started writing, I started asking a lot of questions. And I'm very grateful that both of my parents are very open about their experiences. And they're also divorced, so they talk shit about each other. Um, and that's, that's actually better because you see both sides. And I think the truth is in, 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 in somewhere in the middle. Um, so yeah, so the, it's not, it's easy. I think it's easy because they talked and these are all stories. And I'll read you one poem. My mom had, I think clinically, she probably had postpartum. And in El Salvador, we didn't understand that. And it was very hard for her because she was 18 at the time. And uh, she had to stop going to school. She was a valid, they were both like valedictorians. Um, and then of course they like had me and I guess they didn't learn about condoms or something. But, and then they had me and I, like my birth made their goals so much harder and very gendered. So it was harder for my mom. Like she wanted to go to nursing school she wanted to be a doctor, and then she found it super difficult. So this is in my mom's voice. Postpartum. My son is in the other room. This little burlap sack of rice came out yellow. Some deficiency got incubated, hasn't stopped crying. His father wasn't there. He was out fishing. His father's mother came next day saying, I'm a saint, I'm a saint, I won't let you trick him. The big saint wanted to check my son for birthmarks to see if he's really a Zamora. She found him near his balls. Esa puta didn't even give enough for powdered milk. And don't tell me he looks like his father, maybe the back of his hair. I know his father doesn't love me. You don't have to tell me you're stupid, you're jealous, crazy. Maybe he hears, I wish he hears my moans when he's on top of his horse, like I don't know. I am crazy, but not estupida. If I catch him, me las va a pagar. Me las va a pagar, that dipshit deep in debt over a fishing boat he can't catch nothing in. My son won't drink from me. I pump breasts, rub sugar and honey on them. Why won't he drink from me? And my mom can't curse you out very musically. So it was cool to write in her voice. <laughs> Don't be shy. 
Hi, Javier. My name is Kristen. I work um, in research in the School of Medicine, and I used to work as a, an interpreter for Spanish-speaking patients here at UVA. Um, curious is, how do you think your relationship with Abuelita has changed or will change now that um, you have documentation? And if you can talk to us about how you keep in touch with her. Um, talking with people that you leave behind is, has been, always been super hard for me. I try to avoid it as much as possible. Like I have a weird thing with communication. And I think it's because like of what I went through as a nine year old, because I used to communicate with my parents over the phone or letters or cassette tapes. And now even it's hard for me to call my parents and have like a long real, um, phone call. And it's even harder to call my grandparents back home. I would go like four months without calling my grandparents. And now after going back, um, it's hard to see that everything that my parents and like they sacrifice that to come here and they're sacrificing working here to send money back and to see like these, their parents, my grandparents, like they hoard the money. They don't use it to like fix up the house or anything. It's like nothing has changed. So it's like a lyrical, physical representation of like nothing has changed like why did we ever immigrate you know so that was very hard to take in but the cool thing is that when and my grandma has been like the sponge of all the trauma she she has refused to leave the house and she hasn't left our home like our property for years now because she she's afraid of like what people would talk like like whatever and i i see it as like the vestiges of immigration and trauma she, i feel like she feels and embodies being left behind you know she she would be like this very lively woman who like dressed up she like draws her eyebrows or she used to draw her eyebrows put a lot of makeup like do her hair curl it all of that is gone and so it's sad to see that. But the cool thing is that now that I went back, she's like, oh, now it, it used to be like when we when we talk, she'll be like, oh, I don't know when I'll, hopefully I'll see you like before I die. And now it's like, hey, can you bring me this, this and that next time you come? So I think that's, you know, that's hopefully better for her psyche and for all of her psyche. And now I call her not every week, but like every two weeks because it's still hard. For me you know so that's change and some constant things yeah Hola, oh. yeah. yeah um you talked about my name is maria i'm a master's student um, in curry school of education and um it's it's fascinating everything you said um i would just ask about your time at berkeley um, if you can speak about support and, you know, we, you went through all this trauma and just your decision to apply in Berkeley and um, have 3.9 GPA, which is remarkable, um, how that time there, like, affected, you know, your studies, your life there, and then you pursuing your master's degree, um, how that, all those decisions you made, um, and then, you know, the question why this all matters, um, you know, embodied in, in, in those years, um, how that affected, and now when you look back in the past, um, do you have the answer to all those questions or still not? I think my experience has made me a very pessimistic person and very jaded. Um, and also, it, is, it would be very easy for you or for anybody to look at me and be like, look, the American dream does exist. Or like for me to be considered a good immigrant. And I completely reject that. Um, because yes, I got this thing that it, it, it literally, the green card is called extraordinary abilities. And like, why the fuck do I have to prove to you that I'm extraordinary in order to be like, be legal in this country, I think is completely problematic and bullshit. Um, and I think I'm still very angry 
at being in this country and I'm still very angry at the immigration system. So I think that's my own resolve and that I have to um, do away with. And I also have, and not a lot is talked about, and I, and I guess because then it will be like a Republican uh, talking point, but I, I have a thing against laws. And, uh, and I guess, you know, reading all these memoirs, I think what is, what is getting marketed out there is like a certain type of personality once you live on documentaries to be scared of laws or to, to like hide and to like do this. Not, that is not the effect for, for all immigrants. You know, there are some of us that would say, fuck this. And like, I, I had a shit ton of speeding tickets. Uh, I was not, you know, used to like push and push and push. So that's the other side of the narrative. I also, like I had a 3.9 GPA, but I will also party a lot. And I, all, I got in trouble. I almost had a drinking problem, you know, and like trying to balance all of that. And I tell people that because we can, immigrants, we can do both. We don't only have to be good. You know, we're fucking human beings and we're allowed to do that, which is also my problem with um, the concentration that the headlines and politicians and journalists have of the children. Once you only talk about the children, you're leaving the parents behind and we're not talking about the parents. So I don't know, my time there like really made me jaded and like question everything. I don't, if I could vote, which I can't, I wouldn't vote Democrat or Republican because it's the same bullshit regarding the immigration. You know, Obama didn't do anything. Even if Warren gets elected, she's still inheriting all this fucking system that is still very anti-immigrant, you know? So yeah, that's what Berkeley did to me. <laughs> <laughs> Hola, Javier. Um, I'm not a medical student. I'm a local massage therapist, and I'm a mom. Um, and I'm separated periodically from my daughter because I'm divorced, and it's terrible um, when her body is separated from mine. And it's not the same, but um, two of the big lines in the final um, poem you read that really spoke out to me um, was when you finally figured out how to use the shower because your parents were in the shower with you and they were touching you, and it helped you, and it helped you to understand. Um, and speaking to a room full of um, physicians and, and, and future physicians, um, touch is tantamount to conveying trust and bringing you back to believing that you can exist and feel safe, and that was um, huge to me. My daughter still sleeps with me. She's five years old. She's still nursing. <laughs> She's going to nurse until her wedding night. Um, <laughs> and uh, and it's, it's beautiful because when I have her, we, we sleep in our underwear and, we're, and we sleep in bed together and it's beautiful. And it's all about the touch and that really spoke out to me. Yeah, and which I've always, I've always wondered why. Like it was probably the physician who told my parents to do that. Because I remember like coming here, like I was, again, I was like this shy little boy. And they were like, yeah, come shower with us. Like both of them would be in the shower. And I, and I would be like, oh, this is fucking weird. Like, I don't know you, I've never, I like, I didn't remember my dad. It was weird even like seeing my dad because I seen him in pictures and heard his voice, but it's something different to see his body. And then to see his body completely naked. Yes. And then also my parents, I don't know, maybe because like they're, they were like leftists or something, but they would like talk to me about like the private parts and they would call them by their name, which is also very important, which is like these immigrant parents, like how the fuck did they know to do that? <laughs> which is like, I've always wondered that, but it was very important and it actually made, made the transition period so much faster and, you know, so yeah, thank you for saying that. Tanch is tantamount and I'm so glad you included that. Thank you. We've come to the end of our time, but I, I would also say as a sort of postscript, I was just this morning reading a piece by the uh, head of medical education for the um, Association of American Medical Colleges, and she was writing about the importance of asking patients one particular question, taking time to ask, tell me about one day in your life. 
those details and the kinds of things that you've just been saying that help us to understand why it is you have some of the thoughts and attitudes and understandings that you do, some of the, the simple practices of daily life. Why are these important and how do they make you, you, and how can we take better care of you? So thank you. Thank you. Thank I you. Would, <laughs> And again, I'll remind you, the bookstore is here with books by both uh, Javier Zamora and Irene Matthew. Um, join us next week for a program called Prescribing Nature, New Perspectives on Human Nature Interac Engagement. We'll have with us Jenny Rowe from the School of Architecture, Amy Eichenberger, who's um, an architect with planning and construction here at UVA, and Carolyn Schuyler, who runs a place out, in, out near Crozet called Wild Rock, uh, which promotes engagement with nature. So please join us then. And again, thank you so much, Javier Zamora and Irene Matthew. Thank you. Thank you.